Okay, we're all about timeliness. So let's get started this morning. Welcome to all. My name is Ruth York, and I have the privilege of being the executive director of the Idaho Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. Our name is a mouthful. We have shorter names under which we run our family and youth services. These are Family and Youth of Idaho, or FY Idaho, and Youth Move Idaho, under which we run a variety of programs specifically for youth and young adults. Learn more about both of these at our website, fyidaho.org. We have a small and very mighty staff at the Federation. Michelle Batten is our Family Engagement Director. And while I may be the face of Idaho Federation of Families or IFF for this conference, she is the one who actually makes this conference happen. And I mean, literally, she handles almost every single detail of this conference. <laughs> so shout out to Michelle for sure. Contact information for Michelle and me can be seen in the chat feature. In case you have any need to contact us throughout the conference, you have multiple ways in which you can do that. I want to tell you that every staff member at IFF is extraordinary in their own way, and I'm very blessed to work with this team. We understand youth mental health challenges and the family challenges that occur when a youth is struggling from a very personal place. Lived experience is what draws most people to work at IFF as staff or on our board or as volunteers in various capacity. And that's what makes us an organization of families for families. So let's talk about this conference, <clears throat> Voices Carry. First off, it's important to give a shout out to the sponsor of this conference. That is the Department of Idaho, uh, the Department of Health and Welfare, uh, Idaho's Department of Health and Welfare, and specifically the Division of Behavioral Health. They cover 100% of the costs of this parent education conference annually, and we're very appreciative of their interest and support. What we want you to take away from your time with us at this conference is twofold at a minimum. IFF exists to provide support education and advocacy for parents. And one thing we wanna offer through this conference is a chance for you to learn things that are helpful to your own family journey and to the work you may be doing in helping other families. So we want your, excuse me, your voice to be as strong and knowledgeable as possible as you look for and advocate for services on behalf of your child or children, or as you support other parents on their journeys. The second thing we hope to offer to those of you interested is the opportunity to understand how your voice can impact Idaho mental health care for the better for all Idahoans. You will hear many ways in which your voice is needed and wanted to make the mental health care to make mental health care in Idaho better, more accessible, more expansive, which is the work of all of the speakers that we have for you over the next three days. We'd love to help engage your voice further in this work and have you join the many parents you will hear from who are doing just that. So now let's get started with our first session. We have two inspirational speakers leading us off today. Representative Marco Erickson currently serves in the Idaho State Legislature. He, is, <clears throat> he has 14 years of direct service work in mental health and 25 years of prim primary prevention work which is a very great and unique background uh, for his current legislative work. Organizations like IFF and parents like many of you can be extremely grateful for his health, <clears throat> for his interest in making Idaho a better place to be a youth and family who are experiencing mental health and substance use challenges. There is a really interesting expanded bio on Representative Eric Erickson on our Whova app, which I encourage you to read if you have not already. Representative Erickson is a parent of five children, so he knows the parent journey well. I wanna just say we are really fortunate to have him with us today sharing about his partnerships with many people and organizations across the state to accomplish the passage of a very important piece of legislation for families and youth with extensive mental health treatment needs. His partnership with parent Laura Wallace and how they partnered with many others and their determination to help right or wrong happening across Idaho to parents and youth will be the subject of this opening session. Laura is a, the parent of a youth with severe emotional disturbance or SED as you, you will hear it referred to oftentimes. She uses her own family experience to drive her commitment to help Idaho's youth mental health system understand the youth and parent perspectives and has been doing this for many years now. Please also look at Laura's bio in Whova as well because you will see the many ways she engages in statewide and local efforts to bring her valued voice to youth mental health care in Idaho. 
She is one of the original five parents that the Department of Behavioral Health contracted with as they began to design the YES system of care, which is our current youth mental health system, anyone not familiar with YES. Laura has been a ceaseless parent advocate throughout the implementation of this system and has personally helped countless numbers of parents on their own journey to find appropriate mental health services for their youths. This is a power team we have lined up for you today, and they will open our conference with a session called Relationship Makes Change Possible, which will tell their story of how they use their, their relationship building skills to pass successful legislation that helps many Idaho families today. Michelle and I will be monitoring the chat feature for any questions you have, and we can bring them to the attention of our speakers towards the end of their session, time permitting. Representative and Erickson and Laura, thank you so much for being with us today, and I will let you take it away from here. Well, I am really excited to be here. Um, it's <laughs> it's been a long journey, Marco, hasn't it? To uh, yes, it has for sure. <laughs> when we when we started, so I'm going to start with a little history. For um, looks like about half the people that are watching right now are familiar with House Bill 233. So I'll just kind of walk everyone through how we got to this spot and what we were trying to do, and then Marco and I will talk a little bit about our um, relationships that were required to be you know, part of this. So um, I started advocating for families in late 2016 because I parented a child who had a serious emotional disturbance and um, which is a term I, I detest, but that is the federal and state uh, word that we use for kids who have significant mental health concerns. And I saw some air quote simple changes. And of course, nothing's really simple that I thought if we made them, it would make things better for families. And I was really frustrated and I just wanted things to be different. And in my experience, I would say most advocates that come to this line of work um, or volunteerism um, aren't there because everything's going great. They're there because something has frustrated them or bothered them and they want to see it changed. So um, I think I, I, I think when the systems hurt people we love, we get loud. <laughs> I think it's our, our, as parents, that's what we do. Um, but I, and, and people who know me will laugh at this, but I learned that loud isn't always the best way to make change, but it is usually how we start. And so everyone who knows me just got a good kick out of Laura not being loud because I am very frequently loud. Um, Anyway, as my work continued, uh, we started. I started talking to a lot of families who, over and over again, the story was that they had been threatened with child protection involvement. Um, usually, when they were in the emergency room, sometimes other times, but frequently in the emergency room, and um, the emergency room didn't feel that um, that they were appropriate for acute levels of psychiatric care, or they didn't have a bed. They were appropriate, but didn't couldn't find a bed, and they would tell families things like. If you don't take your kid home right now, uh, we're going to report you to child protection for abandonment and we're going to take all of your children away from you and you'll never see them again if you don't leave now. And the first time I heard that story, I, I gasped. Um, and, but then I kept hearing it over and over and over again. And more and more of the families I talked to who did advocacy work said that they had either personally been threatened with that or they were assisting families who had been threatened that way. Uh, my son happened to actually be in the emergency room when the family across the hall was actually threatened and told that if she had made better life choices as a parent, her kid wouldn't have psychiatric issues. And if she didn't leave now, they'd take her other kids. And so she left and she has refused to get psychiatric care for her kid after that because it's not worth losing her children for. So that was happening around our state. We were hearing it more and more frequently. We had parents we worked with, it was happening to. And um, it was just really overwhelming as an advocate to you know what to do. Um, coincidentally, I ran into a mom who lives in Arizona and she and some people that she worked with actually started something in Arizona called Jacob's Law. And it was for her son that it was named um, for exactly this issue, being using child protection as a threat to get families to voluntarily withdraw from psychiatric care um, for any number of reasons. But they, um, they passed that law in Arizona and um, subsequently 19 states had passed a, a law about Jacob's Law or something similar. And we were state number 20, I believe. So um, and sometime in 2018, I brought um, what is known as Jacob's Law in Arizona to one of our deputy attorney generals. And I said, hey, what do you think? But at that time, uh, a lot of people have been talking about it. It didn't, but it didn't really gain any traction at that point. 
So not much happened. So I also handed it to the attorney who originally drafted what we now know as the Idaho Children's Mental Health Act. And um, he took it and he took Jacob's Law from Arizona and kind of modified it to fit the laws that we already had in Idaho and the wording we used and the systems we have here. And he, um, he handed it out a couple to a couple different agencies who promote children's issues, but it didn't really get any traction. Some people were worried it would undermine child protection or there were other concerns they had, um, but it didn't get any, it, it didn't really get any traction. So fall of 2020, I just was like, I am tired of waiting for someone to decide they want to do something with this. We have more and more families we're hearing about. It's becoming more of an issue. Um, and the fear families had was impacting their ability to get psychiatric care for their kids. And that, I was not okay with that. So um, a group of us got together, um, different advocates, different parents. Um, actually, we had a conversation with the Federation about what, you know, what they had been seeing. And we sat down and figured out who we thought was going to be willing to take it um, forward because um, bills don't actually just get written and then you know fall from the sky and become law. There's a lot that goes involved with it. Um, you know, I think about the was it the Schoolhouse Rock song? I'm just a bill sitting here on Capitol Hill. Yeah, it, it's actually not nearly as poetic and um, cute. Far fewer cartoons involved in getting a bill passed. Um, so. I, I knew that the issue we were trying to tackle was not very well understood. Every legislator I had talked to when I said, hey, this is happening, without exception, their response was, oh, what? You know, and so I knew we had to educate a lot and we had to find the right fit uh, for someone who would be willing to take it to, uh, to the House and to the Senate. There was, you know, we had to find someone who understood our why so that the process would go from beginning to end without us losing the intent of what we were trying to do in the revision process. So um, I ended up talking to Marco. I had known him from other advocacy work. Uh, he had actually just been elected, right, Marco? Yes, yeah, you brand new guy. <laughs> brand new guy. And um, I felt a little bad because, I mean, you hadn't even warmed up your seat yet. And, and I said, hey, we need to do this. And we, um, and we started building a coalition of people who were there to support. And anyway, and we handed it off to Marco because we knew that our why and his why lined up and that it would be important to him to get this through. So anyway, Marco, why don't you explain the relationships that went in from when I showed up on your door, or I guess on your text message and said, help. <laughs> <laughs> well, you kind of have to know me a little bit. My background when I ran for office was specifically so I can, I, I ran on the platform of say, I'm a mental health advocate. This is very important to me and not anybody else in the whole legislature had that as their platform because they, I mean, they'll talk about it, but for me, it was my passion. I had spent all my life and my career in this work. So it made it a little easier to, to kind of have a, a plan for going into the legislature. And so I didn't have any specific bills because I was just kind of a new guy, like she said, and I was wanting to go in there and just learn and watch and figure out the ropes and, I just kind of get an idea. And then I started having people approach me with bills that they had already written. And I was like, well, I'll do these bills. So I ran a couple bills. So I got a, a little bit of experience uh, because doing some juvenile corrections things as that's where I work a lot in advocacy as well, anything to do with youth. And so I kind of got my, some experience and I knew the process, but I had never taken a bill from the beginning and moved it forward because uh, what happens is when agencies run bills, they already have all the process written for you and it's already got a number and it's been through that. And so it made it a lot easier to just do that part. But when Laura came, I was like, oh, this is exciting because this is something I can get behind and I can actually take it through the whole process and, and start from start to finish. And it was the first bill that we put for, that I did that with. And so I'll never, ever forget that bill <laughs> because. Well, and, and I think it's really important good. to note that I came to Marco in the fall, right before the legislative session and said, hey, buddy, friend, pal, what do you think? And that's not normally when bills are started. And remember, it had been drafted long before. There had already been other people looking at it. It wasn't like I handed Marco a post-it note a month before the legislative session and said, what do you think? There had been a lot of legwork. And I know I also mentioned um, the Children's Mental Health Act. Um, uh, it is still law. The Children's Mental Health Act is still part of Idaho statute. 
And what we were doing is adding an amendment, just a little extra piece of language in the existing Children's Mental Health Act. So we weren't trying to rewrite something. We weren't trying to throw anything out. We were just- And I knew that because we had built a relationship. We had worked together. And that's kind of an important part to recognize here is we take a lot of time. Those of us legislators who are involved with community, we all have special projects and different groups we're interested in. And I'm always at mental health things and I would see Laura there and she was advocating for the youth and I was advocating for the, so it worked well because we had built a relationship prior and I knew I could trust that she had done her homework. I knew her story. I knew her family story. So I had listened to those things. That's a very important part to talk about when you're talking about relationship building. It is the number one key piece of getting any legislation passed or, or making create creating change. And people that have relationships actually achieve things in the House of Representatives. I've learned that in my two years there. The ones who focus on these extreme ideas uh, or, or whatever their, their philosophies are, they might get elected on these big, big promises, but they don't have the relationships to pull it off. So it's very important to remember that the grassroots relationships is where you start the conversations, you know. And then the second piece is those other legislators. You gotta remember there's 110 of them, <laughs> including this Senate. So this is a House of Representatives, there's 70 members. And then you've got uh, you know, 35 in the, over in the Senate side, and then you've got the governor too. So you've gotta get it through those three pieces. And if you don't have relationship building skills, you're gonna get nowhere with these bills and people, especially as a freshman, you come in and they're going, hey, look, I'm the expert. It took a little bit of time for people to recognize that, hey, yeah, he really does have skills and knowledge. You know? And this last session, they, it was interesting because I, I planned five bill or zero bills at the first session. I ended up uh, working on five that year. And then this year I planned five going in and ended up working 16. So that just kind of shows you how people trust you, right? <laughs> And the other part of the relationship process is understanding, you know, the, the state agencies that are involved in this, because I haven't had experience in the past where I worked directly for an agency similar to health and welfare. I had a role very similar to theirs. So I understand the bureaucratic process and all the stuff the state has to go through to make these things work. And, and so I'm also looking out for their interests. So even though you know I'm advocating for families, I'm looking out for the interests of those people as well. And so that requires collaboration. <laughs> and you have to remember those relationships do matter also because if they come out against us, uh, we're gonna have a problem. And so we've gotta have a lot more conversations than just this bill, hey, this is a great idea, let's go and, and start this. And that's where we engage you know, the part of the process is engaging others who might have an interest in this work. <laughs> so that's what, that's where Laura and I started with that. And so you want to talk a little bit more about that process or? So when Marco started, you know, bringing agencies and families really to the table and saying, hey, what do you think here? I mean, it would, it kind of changed the conversation. To some extent, it took it out of the hands of the families directly. I mean, we had started with this idea. We, you know, worked to get the language built. The families looked at it and said, yes, this is really, 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 really important. Um, but then the conversations had to be bigger because it had to be something that, as Marco said, that the agencies could get behind or that, um, you know, little things like the words we used have very specific meanings. So saying one word is gonna get one thing done, saying a different word is gonna get something else done. So we had to make sure that all of it was looked at. And so our agencies actually did have some comments and we went back and revised the language. Um, and then the legislative process took over. So I, I mean, Marco was, this was his first legislative session, but I had followed this many bills through the process before. I had no idea what was going on. And Marco will, um, will attribute to the fact that I was totally nervous and he was very yeah, confident was. the whole time. Um, I was like, you know, we're going to over-prepare. And he was like, this is going to be fine. Oh no, we're going to over-prepare. Um, but we had to, you know, some of the quick steps so that you understand is that we chose to start this bill in the House versus the Senate. There were lots of reasons for that, but mainly because Marco was our biggest supporter and advocate and he is a representative. So we started in the House. 
And uh, we had to first get um, the health and welfare committee because that's the, where the bill would have fallen under is the health and welfare committee. We had to get them to agree to even hear our bill option. So um, it's not like you just show up with a, you know, a letter and say, here, read this and it gets a hearing. There's, there's other stuff that has to happen there. And so they did agree to hear the bill. And so the health and welfare committee on the house side um, listened to it. We were able to testify. We had, um, we brought a lot of people actually to testify. And over the course of the time, we had parents, we had the attorney who helped us draft it. We had some advocates and we even had a youth come in and, and speak to these committees. So after it passed with what is called the do pass agreement, which means that they're recommending that the floor actually pass this, um, it, it passed out of the house and uh, committee and then went to the full house for a vote. And everyone in attendance uh, approved it. And so it was unanimous for all in attendance. And I think my mouth kind of dropped as I was watching that on Zoom because, and, and I remember taking a screenshot of the vote because I was like, this is a very surreal moment. Um, and then- um, I and had then already talked there, to everybody, so I knew it was gonna pass like that. Yeah, he had children. talked to everybody. I had not <laughs> talked to everybody. And so, yeah, he was really confident. He was like, of course. And I was like, <laughs> I mean, I almost had a paper bag out I was blowing into because I was like so overwhelmed. But then we had to go and do the same process on the Senate side. So they had to agree to give it a hearing. They did to the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. We testified again. It went to the full Senate floor and it once again passed unanimously. I no longer had a paper bag at that moment. I was jumping up and down, screaming, running around in circles. I had a lot of adrenaline. I'm sure my poor spouse was wondering if I was ever going to actually sit down again. I was just so excited. Um, and then it went to the governor's desk for a signature. Um, that was, I mean, the like- governor I, I, let me sit there and get yes. a picture with him signing the bill. That was really cool. It was, it was very, <laughs> it was very cool. <laughs> and, and, I, and, and honestly, like, I didn't think he was going to veto it, but until the ink was dry, I noticed that my blood pressure came way down when I, when Marco texted me and said, hey, it's done. <sighs> okay. Whew, you know, I can breathe again. So um, I think it's also important to know that there were two parts to this bill. The first part was that um, families could no longer be substantiated on a, on, on, um, for allegations of abuse, abandonment, or neglect, and for attempting to get their kids psychiatric care if their kid was a danger to self or others or their mental health would significantly deteriorate. So um, if they didn't get if they didn't get treatment. So that was the threshold. Like you can't substantiate if this is the situation we're in. So it doesn't cover anything outside of that very narrow window. This wasn't broad sweeping legislation that said all the things. It's just right there. And the second part is that the Department of Health and Welfare has to create an interagency agreement so that, um, that we know what's going to happen. So if a kid if a kid shows up in the emergency room and the parent says, hey, it's not safe to bring them home, then what? What's the next step? So currently they have an interagency agreement um, that I did a public records request once they did that to follow up because getting the bill passed is just the beginning. It's not the now we have a bill, we all sit down, pat ourselves on the back and job well done, mission accomplished, we're over it. Now is when the hard work starts because just because you have a bill doesn't mean people know about it. Just because now it's a law doesn't mean that the hospitals or emergency personnel or child welfare, or any of these people know it exists. So there's a lot of education that has to happen there. And the governor had specifically said to Marco, I want you to watch the implementation of this because it's your, he said, this is your wheelhouse. <laughs> and so I expect you to kind of watch over it and keep them, keep them on their toes. And I said, I'll do that. No problem. And Laura, with Laura's help as well. <laughs> right. And so we have, um, and so it went into effect July 1st of 2021. And that was the first part of the bill. And then 180 days later, the agreements had to be, had to be written uh, that were part of that statute. So um, right now we're just kind of monitoring it. Uh, Marco and I get contacted by parents. Um, they reach out to me as an advocate. And then when they find out Marco is the one who sponsored the bill, he's gotten <laughs> plenty of emails too. Hey, I don't think this is working the way it's supposed to. And then it's our job to circle back with um, the agencies and say, hey, what's, what's going on? And I think right now we're in the stage of we're just having to educate. You know, this is what it is. This is what it isn't. This is how we use it. This is, you know, and and I know the state right now is working on educational and communication materials to help everyone be on the same page. So I know that's where they are right now, um, and it's not perfect yet. 
we're moving in the right direction. <laughs> but um, I think about it. I mean, I originally started this process in 2018 and it's 2022. So we're looking at four years later and I'm still monitoring the thing that exists. So I don't want anyone to think that, you know, putting in legislation is the end. It's actually the, almost the beginning. So now we have like a whole list of takeaways. <laughs> well, and another thing to remember is this year in this session, we had health and welfare come and report in our committee. So again, we have a health and welfare committee at the House of Representatives and we had them report on the implementation of the bill and how it was going. And that was where it was really nice because we had legislators ask specific questions. We were we wanted to know that it's being successful. And, and then we've gotten a not enough feedback from health and welfare on some of the struggles they're having implementing and what's going on to where we're, we're, we're willing like Laura and I were, again, this comes back to relationships. They, they listen to the voices of the consumers on the ground and the struggles they're having and, and, and the problems with, you know, having a certain type of clinician or, or a, someone with their fiscal interest to contr contribute to the conversation, right? So Laura's been really good about having an independent person be in there. And we're really working hard to figure out that little twit niche there because it's still a problem and there's still families who are, throwing their child in this system and going, you just handle it, you know? And that's not what it was intended. It was really a conversation and to get these people working together to solve the problem and not, not just have a, a way out, right? So we, we, had, we had an intent, but sometimes people misuse it. Like Laura said, the education on, on what the bill's intention was has to be there. It's very important. And so we're, we're still in that phase of working together after implementation to figure out the loopholes and the problems and, and then we'll close those gaps and maybe with some future legislation. And sometimes that's what you have to do. Just you just say, we have to make an adjustment, a technical adjustment to this bill. We had unexpected outcomes and here we go. And, and then we do that. And that's our, our way of honoring those relationships, keeping them strong and remembering to work, uh, work together. <laughs> well, I, and you know, when I think when we start this, I mean, we're talking about our takeaways from um, things that we learned, at least uh, things I learned. I don't know if Marco learned them, but things I learned um, is the first thing to do is identify the problem you're trying to solve. And the reason, you know, that sounds like it should be obvious, but I think really often we head into this just mad. I mean, just mad. You know, we don't change laws because we think the ones that are, you know, are there are working great. We change them because we don't like something and we think it needs to be improved. And I think identifying your why is important for a couple of reasons. First for me is that if I know why I'm doing this, then when the agencies or the legislature, legislators come back and say, can we tweak this or can we tweak this? If it changes my why, no. If it doesn't change my why, let's have a conversation about what, you know, what, how can we meet your needs? And for me, my why was we had to stop having families um, be threatened to lose their children and voluntarily remove them from child protection because the other side of that coin is if I take my, sorry, remove them from um, emergency services because if I, um, if I voluntarily remove my child from a psychiatric you know, care situation and they go home and they hurt somebody in my home, then I still have child protection in my house now they're saying I can't protect my other kids. And so I, I didn't want parents caught in that, that catch 22. And my I'm wise wife, line, because I, I, I have mine is the outcomes for the families mm -hmm. that I serve in the public. So our wise align it exactly. And that's why we're able to work together on these projects. <laughs> right. And so that was my why. And so if we needed to change a word or we needed to change a, an order of operation or a step inside the legislation we were proposing, as long as that why didn't get changed I was open to conversation but if they said no we don't want this because and, and that changed you know that that dynamic for families then I would have said no 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 you're you're, you're violating my why and so, Laura got to be like on the flip side I had to sit in a room with those the the people I was proposed to it was quite intimidating at times because there'd be like 10 employees and an attorney general and <laughs> 
oh, I'm just a new legislator. This is weird. And all these people, and I'm like, it's real important to, to recognize and I, you know, not to be intimidated, but just to focus. And they would want to change some stuff. And then I would go back to Laura and say, is this important? What, what do we do here? You know, because I wanted her voice and, and they would say, no, absolutely. We're not changing that. And then we would keep it, you know, because so, we knew their why. And, that, and so she's right. The why is very important to stick to. <laughs> Right. And I know that, you know, I'm sure for as many people are listening today, we could come up with just as many things that need to get changed to make things better for families with mental health kiddos. The question, there's no question that we've got a lot of work to do. We have lots of work to do. Yes. And it's, and it's small and incremental. And, and in, I think, so when you're looking at your why you have to identify the issue you're trying to solve with that one change, because if I had come in and said, I want all of the things fixed, that's not anything that we could have written. It's not something we could have got support for. And it's definitely not a thing we could have passed. And therefore it would have done me no good. Yeah, so a narrow I, focus. <laughs> yeah. So think of, and think of when you have identify your problem, also think of a, pro, a solution. And that also means educating yourself on what is actually current law versus what's happening, because there's laws that are out there that just maybe aren't being followed or maybe need a little clarification um, that you don't have to start all over maybe it's there's a piece of legislation like for example this is an amendment to the children's mental health act it just wasn't in there before and we clarified to make sure everyone was very clear so that was part of it um and it's it's okay to understand that it's tedious like if you go oh i don't want to look at any more statutes or any more rules some of that is boring but if and you that's don't one do of our it, strength she loves that way more than i do <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't do it beforehand you're going to get hit a, hit a brick wall real fast because someone will say, well, we already have that or that's opposed to this, you know, so you need to have that very well understood before you head in. And then I guess Mar the takeaway number two, this is what Marco is best at. I, I try and be good at it, but he is the Jedi master compared to how I do this. And that's building relationships. Um, when I get frustrated, I, I pick up my marbles and go sit in the corner and tell him calm again. Marco is much better. <laughs> at I've had a lot of practice. People tell me I talk too much a lot, but I, I tell them, well, that's just part of who I am. I have to build relationships with everyone. I, I, that's important to me. It's a value I hold dear, but it, and, and, and to make sure those relationships stay strong. And it really leads to better outcomes and, and long lasting uh, relationships that, that can, that could get to, change to happen. And that's kind of why I felt I needed to run for the legislature. I'm like, I can do this. I can create change. And the families need me to be their advocate in there because I understand them and I can be their voice. And that's that's what I've pledged to do. And I'm continuing to do. And I'm excited that I get to carry this work on the next two years. You know, I've been reelected. I didn't have an opponent this time. So it makes it a lot easier to just carry the work on. <laughs> Well, and I think I, I think that when we look at the relationships we're building, there's multiple different types of relationships you have to build. You know, um, one is that you need to recognize that we don't create legislation for one person generally. So if you're going to put put forth a bill, it has to be bigger than one person. So that means you need to have relationships with people that are like you so that when you draft it, it makes sense for a large group of people. And you know, parents and families in similar situations are who you want to talk to or organizations that have common missions. You also want to gather stories that support the solution you are proposing. So whether it's, you know, for us, we could look at other states and say, hey, look, they've already done this. And this is the results that have come from this change. And this is why we want it in Idaho. But if you're going to do that, <laughs> And, and Marco's very good at this too, looking at the opposition. So the people who don't want it, why not? Like, why is your solution not good for them? In a perfect world, we find a solution that's good for everybody. Doesn't always happen. But Marco is like, okay, have we talked to this person? Have we talked to this person? How about this organization? How about this agency? How about this, you know? And I was like, ugh, because remember, we didn't start having this conversation, I mean, in earnest until what, like six weeks before session started? Exactly. And, and in, you know, you need to know that in order to make it pass, you've got to have 36 legislators minimally and you, we, and you had 17 senators and then one governor. So you, you have to be important to look at the opposition and who's going to come out and say, oh, we don't like this. This isn't working. <laughs> 
Yeah. And then and they're going to tell you what to fix a lot of times. Well, and that's why I was nervous and he was confident because he'd had conversations with more than that number of people. And, and I didn't because it's, you know, his role in this process is to work with his fellow legislators to make sure that they understand why and why it's good. And he introduced the bill in, uh, in committee. And, you know, and so it was, um, it was just very different on my role because I was, you know, sitting there waiting for an update of what had happened next or what meeting had happened. And it's kind of like, you know, having a baby and handing it to somebody else and saying, take good care of it and return it when, you know, when it's graduated from high school, yeah. <laughs> it was, good analogy. But, <laughs> but, but snuggle with it and cuddle with it and love it as much as I do. Um, and so having a legislative champion is vital. If you are going to get anything passed, you could have the world's best bill drafted. And if you don't have a legislator who is willing to present it, if you don't have committees who are willing to hear it, nothing else is going to matter. And so, you know, when you're thinking about who your champion is going to be, this is when you have to like pay attention to elections because who's going to run it? What about your election cycle? Like if I pick someone right now who is going to be my champion and they don't make it through the primaries today and they're not even on the ballot in the fall and they're not there next legislative session, who's going to run that bill? And so I, I, I notice personally, I am much more aware of the elections now because I look at it and go, they, okay, matter. they really do. <laughs> they do matter because the, those are the voices. And I know after running this legislation with Marco, I know who is very sympathetic to mental health discussions and who just doesn't understand it, or, you know, it's not that important. They have other priorities. And so I'm like, okay, those people here have priorities, you know, and I'm aware. So that's something and this year there's going to be up to 30 new house members. So then we have a whole new, another learning curve to kind of get a feel for all the people who win tonight's primary. That's a plug to go vote. If you haven't, it's very yeah, right. <laughs> get out and go vote. Um, and so I know that um, when we were discussing this before it actually hit, we had a lot of different parents who were part of, you know, the creation of this legislation who knew their legislators personally in their communities across the state. And I encourage them to just go have personal conversations, not a, hey, we're going to bring some legislation here, but a, hey, this is what's happening to my family. And I know that change is coming. Please pay attention. This is important to me. And you know our story and you know how this has impacted me. And it was interesting that when we had those conversations, we things were a lot easier down the road because they already knew why Marco was talking about this because someone in their district had already contacted them and said, hey, this is a thing. Very valuable because legislators care when you send an email or a direct phone call and it's not a cookie cutter thing. It's, it's, it's coming from your heart. They love that and they, and they usually respond. Most of the, the good ones will respond to you. <laughs> so it's very important to do what Laura's talking about. And if you have the ability, make sure you have a House and a Senate champion that can work together. So that was one of the things that we had to do is we needed to find a senator who was, since Marco was on the House side, we needed a senator who was willing to, uh, to run it through the Senate process because Marco can't. That's not his job. He can't stand up on the Senate floor and talk about it. He needed a senator to do that. Um, and because that means you're now branching out farther and farther from the original person who championed it, that means making sure you have talking points that you've put together short and sweet so that someone who this is not their passion project can still speak competently to the subject and, and persuade people with the points. Um, if it was up to me, we would have had a 20 page dissertation <laughs> on why they needed to pass this. Marco kept saying fewer words, fewer words. And we so, had one page and it worked. And how many votes did we get on the Senate? A hundred percent. Yes, yes, I know. Um, but once again, refer back to, I've just handed you my baby. <laughs> and you can see how slow this process is. It did, it's not like you just go, boop, done. It, it's work, and, and but it's all worth it because that's what we do. We're there to make a difference with these families and serve you guys. Yeah, it, it, it is quite a bit of work. Um, it was exhilarating. Um, it was really exhilarating. I have to say on a personal note, my family who doesn't live in Idaho, so they have really no vested interest in Idaho politics. They were getting a, 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 a um, shockingly frequent updates for me. <laughs> and they were just like, well, that's nice. No, that's nice. No, that's nice. <laughs> but I was like, 
this excitement is too much for just me. I have to share it. And uh, anyway, so it was it was slow, but it needed to happen. There's a lot of moving parts that you don't necessarily have control over. So some of the things that were hard for me is, okay, so they agreed to, to hear this bill and committee, when? And it's wait, 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 wait. Oh, it's on the agenda tomorrow. Oh, everyone get there to testify, right? And sometimes it'll get on the agenda and then they'll pull it from the agenda. I've had that happen on other bills. It drives you crazy because you have people who are gonna drive to Boise and then I'll say, never mind, wait. Don't drive to Boise. <laughs> it's next week. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. that happens a lot, and it's just part of the, what you have to be prepared to make yourself adjustable. Well, and then once it gets out of committee, it gets put on the list of things that are going to be voted for on the floor, whether it's the House or the Senate. And the thing is, is if you look at that agenda, their agenda might be thirty or forty things that are going to be going that day, and they might get to six. And then at the end of, this, of their session or at the end of that day, they're gonna say, okay, we're gonna vote to rearrange tomorrow's agenda. No, and they'll move things up to the top and push yours down. And so maybe you're 25 today, but you might be 35 tomorrow and then 15 and then 40. And, and then I've also had it have, have the opposite happen where I had a hearing on a bill in health and welfare committee and that exact same day, they moved it straight up to the third reading calendar and I had to present it. And I was like, what? <laughs> I just got it through committee. So sometimes things move really fast and you just have to be prepared at all times. Well, and, that and that's what he said, the third reading calendar. They don't just vote on it. There's like, we read it, we send it to committee, it comes back from committee, we re-acknowledge it. And then, I mean, like, it, it, like, it's not a one and done. There's a process with the clerks and how they put it into the, the official records. Yeah, so all that is part of how, how this... It's, so, a, it's a lot of moving parts like she it said. was nerve wracking and of course we're passing this through the um you know last year where we still had all the covid protections and so there weren't weren't a lot of people in person and so i'm watching it online and then they took a break and then they came back and i was like no so um i i did spend a lot of quality time watch with it on my monitor for those of you who have nothing else going on all of the legislations legislative sessions are live streamed and um so you can watch it in real time riveting excitement as they go in and out um, and take breaks and all the other things they do it's all sitting there for you to watch and then when your bill is the next one to get voted on and they close down for the day and they rearrange the <laughs> agenda and send it for tomorrow, you're like, ah, but yeah, we, we did that. But no, just know that that's part of the process and don't get terribly frustrated. I mean, obviously I got terribly frustrated, but if I- Not was linear through, like you would think, like, yeah, she's- No, she's, it's she's, not, <laughs> it's not, it's, it's more like this. <laughs> And, and then get to the end. And it's the web, like all over the place. It, it, it is, but if I did it again, I think I'd be substantially calmer about it. I think I'd be able to um, be a little bit more chill. But um, anyway, so I know- And that message is really, any of you can do this. Like really, you can. You can. And, and Laura's a living example of that, starting from her advocacy part all the way through. I mean, I legitimately started because I was mad that something totally different was happening and I end up doing this. And I do have to say on a personal note, how cool it was to circle back to the mom who started this in Arizona and actually say, hey, guess what? It's the 20th state, I just got it. I helped get that through. And you, what you did spread. And I think that that's one of the things I realized in this process is the more people we talked to, the more understanding we got on this, what is it really a very small piece of legislation when you look at number of words and you know areas that it touched in code. Um, it's a very small piece, but it has a huge impact, but the number of people we educated through this process, the number of people who understand why it's an issue. And when it's time to come back with our next thing, we have a large body of people who already understand why families like ours are having these conversations. And that is new. I mean, that's progress towards the next thing. Now. We're not babies trying to do our first bill anymore. We've done it. So it's a lot easier. <laughs> it is, is definitely a lot, a, a lot easier. So I know we have a couple minutes left. I mean, we've talked about knowing your why for me. It was making sure that we remove barriers so that families had access. 
And Marco, your why was making sure that what? How would you state your why? I just want to have good family outcomes for every potential family member out there. So I'm going to advocate until I, until I die. That's it's what I've lived for is making a difference in people's lives. So that's my why. Right. So, I mean, I guess we've got a couple minutes left. If we want to answer questions. I don't see any that have popped up recently, but. Um, I think there are none in the Zoom chat and we're monitoring the um, Huba chat. And uh, while we had a couple, they got answered as you went nicely. So that was perfect. And um, I do not see any others. Let me let anybody who might have a burning question out there, let me tell you to get it in the chat super quick so we don't <laughs> let Marco and Eric, uh, Mar Marco and Eric, uh, Marco and Laura go. Uh, prior to that, I've got a little bit of ha conference house cleaning I can do. <clears throat> well, I would, I, I think one of the other things that I would say is that I was um, originally when I started this, I mean, the reason I handed it to, other people to begin with was because I started with the miss, you know, the misassumption, I guess, because it wasn't a good assumption. It was a bad assumption that I didn't have the ability, the authority, the, you know, the knowledge, the skill to do something like this. And the number of parents that we brought to the table, I mean, I touched on it briefly, but dozens dozens were part of this and the number of agencies that you know and, and organizations and nonprofits and advocate groups that were part of this it was a pretty huge robust group and it didn't occur to me when i started this that i had what it took to stand at the front and lead the charge um that was pretty overwhelming to me like you want me to do what again <laughs> and and now i'm i mean I wouldn't do it again unless I found something else I was passionate about. This is not a process you want to go through because you're bored and have nothing else to do on your day. It's a lot of work, but because it was something I felt so passionate about, it didn't feel like work. It felt like, it felt like filling a little hole in my soul that I didn't know I had. And now that we're watching uh, the, the, the Idaho code, which for all of you who just can't get enough, it is now Idaho code 162426A. I know, needle point that on a pillow. I almost did. Um, <laughs> but it, um, but as we as as we go through it, I mean, if I found something else that that really spoke to me on the same level, I would definitely do this again. I was scared the first time. Um, but Marco made it incredibly painless. He held my hand all the way through it. And I think he probably patted me on the head more than once. Calm down, Laura. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Um, but I just, I know that I didn't think I had it in me until I did it. So I would say to parents who are like, gosh, that's way out of my wheelhouse. It probably is not way out of your wheelhouse. But I, the thing I learned the most was there was that moment for me to shut up and let Marco take it because my passion was great, but he needed to be able to have a conversation that was logical and detail-oriented with agencies and build relationships that wasn't about my, my emotion or the stories I had from my families that I worked with. And so that partnering, we couldn't have done it. Like I could not have done it without Marco being exceptionally more sage <laughs> when it came <laughs> when it came to that and i was really grateful that i got to be the first one to uh convince marco to to run this and thank you it was a it was a pleasure it was so much fun and she got a copy of the original bill and the governor's pen that he signed it with i made sure she she had those as mementos of this awesome achievement <laughs> and i squealed all over again when that arrived in the mail <laughs> i'm making this a really really undignified sound when i'm that happy so uh, well deserved for sure. Um, none of us would have doubted that you had the uh, um, tenacity for this process at all. But I think it's a really important message that you share with parents that it may feel like this is more than I can do and really important for you to say, get started and see if you can't find the right partners to get through it. And you guys are certainly a dynamic team. Um, not just to have created this <clears throat> great bill for us, but um, legislation now, 
Um, but as conference speakers, I can't thank you enough. Um, love your energy and um, thank you just so much for being here this morning. That's what really what we have in our chat at this point. Uh, a thank big you. thank you to both of you. Um, <clears throat> Let We're glad tell. to have been here. And, and I would just say for all of those listening, find out what your passion is and start that research. It's not a quick process. So it may be the thing that is upsetting you is already in statute right now. And it's just not being followed. And then the, it's a different conversation. And it may be that it needs clarification, or it may be that um, there is a policy or a procedure that's in place that already addresses your stuff, and maybe not. So public records requests are your friend. <laughs> if you need more information about what your, your passion is, start there. Um, and so, oh, I saw another comment come up. Um, is there any movement to change the process out of the emergency room? And from statute, I mean, yes, obviously 1624-26A changes some of that, but I do know that um, the Division of Behavioral Health right now is working towards what that looks like. And I know there's a lot of work there and work groups that are happening right now with advocates and parents and agency staff right now. So I do know that. Ruth actually may know more about that than I do because I haven't been involved in that group specifically, but I know that there is a lot of communication that is being created with at the state. Um, the Department of Health and Welfare is working on right now to communicate these changes from this statute um, that they're trying to communicate to hospitals and parents right now. And that's in the works. It's in the review. It's in the review cycle right now. So I hope that answers that question. If, if I got the question right. Thanks, Laura, for touching on that. Um, we are at 1220 and we're going to come back at one. So I would like to give everybody uh, the full amount of time between now and then to grab some food. Our next session is um, out of uh, two wonderful folks out of the juvenile justice um, area and they're going to speak on um, parent involvement in that system. And so please come back for that. Try and get logged on uh, just a little bit early and we'll do a prompt start at one o'clock for that. And then I'm gonna save uh, a little bit more conference housekeeping, a bunch of this, the very opening of the conference. Um, so I'll go back to just a few housekeeping things for you to know after our next session um, at two o'clock and then we'll be done for the day. So thanks again to our great opening speakers this morning. Thanks for all of you who are out there attending today, uh, get some lunch. Lunch, have a break, catch up on emails, and join us back here at one o'clock. Thanks a lot. Bye, guys. Bye.